So hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein. As always, I'm so happy to be here with you, especially today. Many reasons to celebrate. One, my friend and special guest, Leslie McGuirk, is here, and she's going to talk about a whole bunch of interesting things, and especially how to cope when Mercury has gone retrograde. Um and the other thing I'm really excited about is that we're finally out of what I think has been the worst Mercury in retrograde in, in as long as I can remember. But let me tell you a little bit about Leslie once again. Of course, you may have caught the other podcast interview I did with her, but she is um, someone who is that rare person who is really talented at a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm not kidding. Um Leslie is a very successful children's book author. She is also the author of a popular book that we'll talk about today, The Power of Mercury, Understanding Mercury Retrograde, and Unlocking the Astrological Secrets of Communication. Leslie is a commercially successful artist. She's a successful and highly sought after presenter, and she's an astrologer, and of course, many other things. But Leslie, without further ado, I want to welcome you. Thank you. It's always fun to talk to you, Tracy. <laughs> it's so great to see you. Um, you are probably the most in demand person ever, especially when Mercury has gone retrograde. A lot of people dread and and loathe this time. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what it is, how you got interested in this, what we need to know to navigate Mercury and retrograde more successfully. Right. So people loathe it for the most part because things go wonky during Mercury retrograde periods, unless, and this is the key thing that most people don't know about. If you were born when Mercury was retrograde, it means when it goes retrograde, it's actually a good time. And what that means, Tracy, is that when it goes direct and everyone else is sighing with relief, like, oh, my God, finally, Mercury's out of retrograde. All of us, including me, who was born during Mercury retrograde, we feel the way you do when it's uh, retrograde, only when it goes direct, we feel funky for most of the year. So we have to get used to it. Do you see what I mean? It's like really, uh, if I live my life freaking out about what Mercury retrograde is doing to me, I would not be able to function because literally when it goes direct, that feels like it's retrograde for me because I was born during Mercury retrograde. Does that make sense? It's like I have the flip of everyone else. It does make sense. And I think it's something almost no one knows. Um, no one knows this and it, it, no one ever talks about it. That's why I wrote the book, because what happens, let's just talk about people who are born with Mercury retrograde in their chart. That's me. OK, 20 percent of the population. It's not a huge percentage. We are different. We don't think like other people. We're kind of going left when other people are going right or we're up and down and everything's kind of unusual, but it's original. A lot of super creative people were born during Mercury retrograde. So Mercury retrograde, the good thing about Mercury retrograde is that during these periods when everything's wonky, you actually have a chance to be more creative than normal because your brain and everything in life is forcing you to do things differently. So it's a time of breaking patterns. So someone could say, well, I don't want to break my pattern. I said, well, you may not want to, but it's actually really healthy. You're not supposed to do the same thing with your body every day. So I'm a big fan of Feldenkrais, the Feldenkrais method. Oh, you know yeah. what that is? I do. So Feldenkrais is a method of breaking patterns in the body. And what I believe I do with astrology is break patterns in the brain. But it's very important. In order to have openings, you have to break patterns. So during Mercury retrograde, things will be broken. Your toaster might break. Your car might have a glitch. Usually, it's not terribly serious. And you just have to wait it out and look at it like, wow, maybe there's a little opening here for me rather than something negative. The other way to look at it is that Mercury retrograde, first of all, it's an optical illusion. None of the planets really go backwards. But what happens when this illusion occurs and the planet looks like it's going in reverse because Mercury rules communication 
and anything to do with how we talk, whether it's through the phone or computers. When it's retrograde, it's like you're driving your car and all of a sudden it goes into reverse. So is that good or bad? Well, it's fantastic if you're stuck in your garage and you want to come out of it. Otherwise, you can't get out. Or if you need to parallel park, you cannot parallel park without being in reverse. So yeah, it's, it's not, you can't go forward. But if we didn't have mercury retrograde times where we're forced to retreat and all the words that begin with RE, review, retreat, revise, recalibrate, we absolutely need these times because without them, we're just mechanical buzz saws just zooming through life. And one of the most dangerous, toxic things that's happening to humans right now is that we're all going so fast. We're so inundated all the time. Everything is about speed and forward motion. It's not really healthy because when you're going that fast, you can't notice anything that's going slower than you. So when it goes retrograde, you are forced to look at things differently. So I don't look at it, at it as a bad thing at all. When people get all very, very upset about it, I just think, well, you should be thinking about those of us who were born with it, because it means we only have about, um, you know, between four and six weeks a year when everything's going smoothly for us, when we can go forward. The rest of the year, we live in a permanent state of mercury retrograde. Because when it's direct, it feels funky to us. So I just can't, I just don't buy into this um, feeling that it's just this dreaded thing. Because if I did, Tracy, I would have a miserable life. I would be <laughs> complaining all the time. Things are always a little funky for me. You can ask anybody who knows me well. I mean, this is just what it means to be born with Mercury retrograde. So I look at it as highly creative and a super useful thing for having a bigger opening. So we need these openings and um, it's like weather. You get mad because it rains. Well, you need the rain. So we can't look at these planetary movements as good or bad. They just are what they are. And it's just weather. These, when I also um, hear people say, well, I'm blaming all this on Mercury retrograde. It's an influence. We, we don't do that with rain or weather or snow. Like I'm going to blame my bad mood on the fact that it's snowing. I mean, you can do that, but we tend to not do that to the weather, but we'll get mad at a planet. I just think it's kind of um, not the best way to look at it. I think it's really so um, unique, your take on this period. And I think it is really important because you're right. If we are always just going, 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 there's so much that we miss. And I like that you point out that all the rewords like review, reflect, recalibrate. And I'm going to say also recheck, um, you know, check that email before you send it out, check to see how what you said was received, check before you sign a contract. These are things that are helpful to do anyway. How many times a year does Mercury go retrograde, though? Between three and four times a year for about two to three weeks. Okay. But I will tell you that this last Mercury retrograde, it was brutal for me. I was just telling you before we started recording that I had written an email to somebody and um, it was an important email and I thought they hadn't written back. And the day uh, Mercury just went direct uh, on the 18th. So on the 17th, um, I noticed that they had responded to me. And I was like, oh, my God, I missed it. That's such a Mercury retrograde kind of thing. Normally, that stuff happens to me more when Mercury is direct rather than when it's retrograde. But there it was popping up its little head there. And it was very, very strange because the minute that Mercury went stationary, so it goes backwards and then it stops and then it goes forward. When it was stationary, all of a sudden, I got phone calls, emails from people all over the world for different things I've been waiting on. So it all broke right at that moment. So we are 100% under planetary influences. Electromagnetic energies are impacting us all the time. The fact that everything sort of shifted for me on the date that it was stationary and now that it's direct, all of you guys who weren't born during Mercury retrograde, you can go back to feeling 
a sigh of relief, like, <sighs> oh my God, this is over. And I can start feeling like my, my life will, like the warning light on my uh, new car is on and I've got to go get that fixed. That's like a Mercury retrograde thing. Uh, it started during Mercury retrograde and it's still here. And then think about this. Remember with uh, Christmas, all the Southwest airline problems, all oh, that. Yeah. Okay. Guess what? That wasn't Mercury retrograde. It was just awful. You know, it's just <laughs> life. It just happens. So what I'm most interested in with Mercury is why I wrote the book was because I wanted people to realize that your sun sign tells you like what kind of car you are. Are you a Mercedes? Are you a Lexus? What are you? But your Mercury sign is actually more indicative of how you operate in a day-to-day -day way because it tells me how you use language and how you talk and how you communicate. So to know your Mercury sign is a very, very important thing for um, parents with children, for bosses with their uh, um, employees and coworkers and husbands and wives and any kind of partnership, friendships. If you can understand the differences in all the, the 12 different communication types, then it just makes life so much easier. I was teaching at Rancho La Puerta where I met you originally many years Love ago. It. Yeah, there was this woman there with her teenage daughter and they were constantly fighting. So they came to my Mercury class and I moved people around the room according to their communication style. So there are four types, there's fire. So guess what? Fire people are like sharp, angular, no nonsense. They can be a little bit mean, but they can also be funny. But they're they're the ones you want to have defending you if anything's going. They have no problem speaking up. And then there's the water people who are like me. Mine is in cancer. I hate fighting. I don't like loud noises. I don't like people who yell. So it's totally different than the fire people. And then there's earth people which is what you are, which is you like things to make sense. If you can understand it, you can, your brain can deal with it. And then the last group is air, which is um, where it's all about thinking, thinking, thinking. It's less emotional. It's more of like a mental thing. So anyway, this mother and daughter came to the class. The mother had her mercury in fire and the daughter was water. And I said, you guys, it, these two elements, it's not easy. Your daughter feels totally evaporated by you. You come in and dry up every little bit of water molecules she's got. And then when she's upset, she douses water all over you. So the two of them had been doing this their whole life. So what was amazing, Tracy, in this workshop, they were both crying and saying, oh my God, you mean my mom and my, and the daughter was saying about her mother and the vice versa. Like, you mean, she's not doing this to drive me crazy. This is just the way she's designed. Yes. And once you know it, then you can be like, wow, they're not trying to destroy each other, but they are completely different with how they process. And we don't get mad at animals for having different processes, but we get mad when humans do. So interesting that you're saying this, because I'll, I'll say to Jason sometimes like, you know, not most of the time we communicate very well, but sometimes it's this parallel conversation, I'll call it. And 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 we've, you know, everybody has had this experience where they feel like they're using so much energy to try and communicate with somebody. And it feels like they're both talking generally about the same thing, but not exactly. And it's like there's not, there's no connection. Um, or there's or there's a misconnection, if that's even a word. Right. So with you guys, it's his Mercury is probably not in Earth. It's probably in in uh, air or fire. I can look it up if you want me to. But it's once okay. you understand it, it's like, wow, OK, I get it now. He's he's just operating at this place and I'm operating at this place. And as long as you know it, you just have to think of the animal kingdom like you wouldn't get mad at a porcupine for having quills. <laughs> or, you know, or a dog for barking and it doesn't meow, we allow animals to be what they're designed to be. But why do, we're animals too. Why do we think that we don't have as specific ways of communicating as every animal does? I love that. I love that. You know, I love that astrology is a way of looking at like you're saying, the differences between people and understand it's a way to help us be more compassionate and patient with each other and tolerate that everybody's not exactly expressing themselves the same way. 
And I never knew this before astrology. I was always upset that people weren't more like me. I just didn't get it. Then with astrology, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to drive myself crazy. I now see people are totally different. And some people have an aspect for delusional thinking. I go looking for that all the time. And if I see it, I know that that's going to be hard for me. Can they help it? No. But is it difficult for me? Yes. Leslie, I want to ask you two questions. I'm going to put them out there just so that we have them on the kind of mental table. Um, One is, well, one would be a comment and another's a question. A comment I wanted to make is that I heard you say that our natal chart, which is kind of like a map of who we are and who we will evolve to be, kind of, you're going to describe it much better than I will, but you described it as like a song and you described it, you said you have to learn to like what you're born with. And I thought, holy cow, that's so profound because so many of us walk around thinking how much happier we would be if we were different in some significant way, more talented at this or less likely to do that or whatever. And what you're saying is you can actually do better embracing what you're working with what you've got. So that'll be the first thing I'll put out there. Okay. Yeah. So what's important about this is that all of us have some, most of us have something in our chart that we don't like. And we battle with particular aspects that can really bring us down. So let's say in your chart, you have a genetic tendency towards alcoholism. It doesn't mean you have to be an alcoholic. It just means you got to watch it. It's there. So there are definitely patterns in the chart that we're supposed to outgrow. We're not supposed to stay stuck doing the lowest vibration of our musical score. And eventually the, the goal is to totally out, 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 not outlive, what's the right word, out, grow out of your chart. Like you don't even have to do it anymore because you've already learned all the lessons and you're just cruising. It's like a really master musician. They don't need to read music. They just know it. They just sit down and do it. And that's what, that's what being a master is that you can, like, I can just look at a chart and start reading it right away. That's not something you can do after one or two years of learning astrology. It takes many, many years to become a master at something. And most people get very impatient. They want to become masters right away. And that's just not the way it works on this planet. No. And I think that's such a good point. And and along the lines of what you were just talking about, it makes me think of people who feel like they should be something, but they're really born to be something else, or they're born to be something and people tell them, well, you should do something else. And I'm just going to think, I'm just going to say like, if you're born to be an artist or a creative and your family wants you to be in business or do something that they get that resonates with them, or that's part of their social expectation. And it it really is draining to try to be something other than what resonates with you. Well, this is exactly what happened to me. Um, I went to this astrologer when I, I was 19. My parents were worried about me. And she basically said I was insanely creative and I need to be an artist and a writer. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't really know what you're talking about because I've never had anyone tell me I have any talent in art or writing. And my parents were not happy about this news. Like they wanted me to go in. If you're going to be creative, go into advertising. And uh, that I just I couldn't do it. I had I, the astrologer was 100 percent right in describing what I was going to be and what I needed to do with this chart that I had. And she told me that I had a very narrow little pathway like this big to travel on. And if I got off the pathway, it would not be pretty, which I totally know is true. So I took her advice and I stayed on this very strict creative path. And also the world of astrology, she said, art, creativity, design, writing, and um, anything to do with astrology would be good for you. Now, it was interesting. My parents, after they heard this news from the astrology session, they then sent me to go get a Johnston O'Connor aptitude test. Have you ever heard such a thing? I actually haven't, and I feel like I should have. <laughs> well, I don't know if they still do it, but it was, it's not an IQ test. It's like four days of doing all these weird things like puzzles and listening to sound, and they, they figure out what you're naturally good at. So it's like a scientific thing. 
but it actually is the same as astrology because they, at the end result, guess what happened? They, they had a little meeting with me and my parents. And now I'm like 20 years old. They're still, you know, disgusted that I want to be this artist. And the guy sat down with my parents. He said, well, your daughter is very unusual. Um, she should never be a doctor or an architect. She has no sense of three-dimensional space. Uh, music is not her thing. Uh, she's wildly creative. So anything to do with art, creativity, and design. But then the, the guy just folded his arms and he said, well, there's really just one profession that's perfect for her. She should be the next Barbara Walters. She's great wow. at interviewing people. <laughs> yeah, so my parents were not happy. They were like, what? Nobody gets to be the next Barbara Walters. Walters like it was just bizarre that he confirmed pretty much a lot of the same things that the astrologer had said it's just amazing and honestly I have to say I'm so glad you listened to what your heart and your soul and what you're meant to do um all of that uh that was very inarticulate but you know what I mean I'm glad you followed your path because it it was very very difficult I have to tell you because I would not wish what I went through as a creative person on anyone, because my children's books were rejected for 13 years before I got them published. That's like one book was rejected over 150 times. I was told repeatedly that I had no talent. So I never, I mean, who, who hangs in there that long? That that was, you know, that's not healthy. That was, that was difficult, but now I've sold over 2 million books around the world and nobody can reject me and say, I'm not creative. Um, But that that also shows in my chart that um, nothing nothing usually comes that easily unless unless it's completely in alignment with my higher spiritual growth. Then it's like I'm walking on a cloud with miracles left, right, and center. No, and you're definitely and in the podcast that I think the interview we did a while back. I think you talked about that and that honestly, like you were you've had an incredible journey. Um, just to touch on a few highlights, like you said, selling over two million books and your 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 creations, your artistic creations are adorable. And in fact, you were a premier designer at Takashimaya. You've had an incredible journey because you yeah, listen like to out, out of are. this world. Crazy. The other thing that I don't think I've ever told you this, but the the um, astrologer said that I would always know very famous creative men. And when, and it's been true. And when I was at Sarah Lawrence College studying fiction writing, again, only because the astrologer told me I should be a writer, my writing teacher was Alan Gerganis, who wrote Oldest Living Confederate Widow Tells All. And he um, became obviously very famous with that book. But he told me to read The Ginger Man by J.P. Dunleavy. And I read the book right when I came back from uh, a week in Ireland where I was going to summer school. When I came back, Tracy, I'm reading this book, and in the novel, he he mentions the street I lived off of in Bronxville, New York, and all the other weird places that I had just been in in Ireland were in this book. And I thought that that's weird. So, that is weird. a couple of weeks Good later, weird. I was in the Yonkers, New York Library, and I'm walking down the um, aisle, and my elbow hit a book, and it fell off the shelf, and it was a book on how to contact famous authors. So I looked up J.P. Dunleavy and thought, I, you know, I guess I need to write this guy a letter. I mean, here's another weird coincidence. Why did <laughs> I find this book? And so I wrote to him. And it turns he lived in Ireland. And it turns out I was the first, quote unquote, fan letter he had ever responded to. And he actually became a huge influence in my life, like a major mentor. And he's the one who named my company McGorks Quarks, and he basically gave me an MBA in creative thinking. Every time he came to the States, I would take, you know, six hour walks with him in New York City. So this astrologer was right. Like I had a very famous author as my friend and mentor and, and guide to protect me from basically, he told me never sell anything you've ever created. You can license it, but never sell it. So that's why I was able to 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 retain all the copyrights. That's amazing, Leslie. I'm going to switch gears for a second because I know that you have a tight schedule, but I wanted to ask you, as someone who is constantly thinking about astrology and looking at what's coming, not only for individuals but just kind of globally, 
do you have a sense of based on your reading of the 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 stars what is coming generally this year like just cuz you know again the last sev- the last many years have felt so they it's felt like we've been in mercury retrograde for like six plus years <laughs> so it's been it's been brutal and before when right before um covid hit I, I don't know if I told you that I, I saw what was coming. I didn't know what it was. I just said, these were my exact words, which were recorded during one of my classes that I was teaching in 2019. I literally I said it. to my class, these were my words, life as we know it will be over. Like something is changing how we live. It's never going to be the same. And sure enough, COVID, we all stopped everything. The world shut down. So we don't have anything like that coming up. Nothing that Good. big. But we do have in 2023, well, in 2023. Yeah, I haven't looked beyond that because I can't handle sure. it. No, I don't blame <laughs> like you. I, I don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> getting through one year. Okay, so this coming year is basically two steps forward and one step back. We're going to make progress. We're in a time of giant transformation. There are very, very big, significant changes happening. One is that Pluto which has been in Capricorn. So we know your Mercury is in Capricorn. So Pluto, if she was an actress, she'd be the grim reaper. She's death and rebirth. She feels like nuclear. She comes in and she says, I'm going to tear you up, Tracy, wherever I fall in your chart. And I'm going to make you die off and be reborn. So you've had her sitting on your brain. It takes 20 years for Pluto to leave a Zodiac sign. So finally, Pluto's going to move into Aquarius. So anyone who's an Aquarius or has Aquarius planets or wherever, we all have Aquarius somewhere. So don't think for one second that you're not going to feel the effects of it. But it's it's more intense if it's right on your sun or your moon or your Mercury. So it's going to dip into Aquarius for a little bit this spring and summer. I forget the exact dates, but it's it's only going to dip there for a little bit and then it goes back into Capricorn again. So you're so going to have another doing this. Yeah, it, they, it goes back and forth, just like Mercury goes back okay. and forth. And so, then it will finally move into Aquarius and it'll be there until 2043. Wait, so that's bad or good for me? <laughs> oh, for <laughs> you, well, me. <laughs> for your brain, it's great. I don't know what else you have in your chart. But, okay. Um, yeah. But, but Pluto's getting yeah. out of my way? Yes. Okay. Finally, all the death Thank and rebirth, you. all the mental anguish. So you could say, well, that those were really hard. Um, but Pluto, you got to be friends with Pluto because she brings the greatest gifts and the greatest wisdom. And she's basically my ruling planet. I had to learn to like her. She's a little hard to like because of her <laughs> nuclear powers. It's yeah, it's not easy to constantly feel like you're like a little <laughs> caterpillar and your eyeballs are melting and then you're going to turn into a butterfly like that's like fun maybe once you don't need to keep doing it. <laughs> but Pluto just keeps wanting transformation. So that's that's a big thing. The other big thing that's happening is Jupiter, the planet of good fortune, is moving from Aries into Taurus. So Aries had a rough couple of years because Uranus, the planet that makes you feel like you're living inside a pinball machine, was in Aries, driving all of them crazy. Then Jupiter came in and said, look, this is the cleanup crew. We're going to make it easier for you now. So now Taurus is getting shaken up with the Uranian energy, and then the cleaning crew of Jupiter will come in and make it easier. So everyone's going to feel pretty heightened. We've got... um five planets that are making major changes, things that haven't occurred in 20 years or eight years or two years. Saturn is also going into Aquarius from Pisces. Um, So that's going to be good too. So there's a lot of stuff happening. And um, I I think we're going to feel like these fits and starts, which can give you whiplash. That's what this year is going to be like. And March is the biggest month of all. There is some very intense stuff happening in March. And I'm hoping that there is a chance that that horrible war will be over then. There's something about more humanity occurring in March, but there's also a lot of crazy upheaval as well. Um, 
And by the way, that Jupiter and Taurus, so remember that's like Santa Claus moving into the sign of Taurus, will start on May 16th. So okay. Taurus people will be a lot, lot happier after May too. Great. But there's a lot going on. We also have four um, eclipses. And those, the first one is on April 20th. Uh, that's a solar eclipse. And then the next one is May 5th. That's a lunar eclipse. And then the next one is another solar one on October 14th. And then the last one is lunar on October 28th. So it's very unusual that every one of these is follow, follow, falling in either fire, earth, air, and water. It's all very balanced and even. But these eclipses, mark them in your calendar, those dates I just gave you, because it magnifies energy. It's like a full moon on caffeine. Like that's oh. how intense they are. So you're going to feel them four days before and two days after. And that's just another intense time. We're not in the easiest of times. People are really suffering because there isn't a lot to hold on to that's making people feel safe. There's very little that's around that giving comfort because people are not understanding what's going on. And that's where astrology is so important and why I'm obsessed with teaching people how to read charts. I've got another beginner class. I know your husband took oh, great. it, but I've got another beginner one coming up at the end of this month. It starts on January 31st and it's two hours for the next four weeks after. Um, but after eight hours of instruction with me, you will have the ability to look up anyone's chart and at least understand the basic wiring system. And to me, that's such a big thing for having peace, gives you peace of mind. There's nothing else on earth that can give you the peace of mind that astrology can give you. Well, it's like understanding yourself and understanding others. Yes. Again, like helps us to be more tolerant and patient and take a, 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 a bigger picture of you. But if you don't understand that what you're going through, there's a reason for it. I once had a woman, a very evolved spiritual teacher, who she had six of the worst weather patterns I've ever seen a human being endure. And she was at a breaking point. And I just said to her, look, this, this is bad. This is not going away for another year and a half. You just have to ride it out. But no, it's, it's just weather. It's going to change. And you know, we joke about it now because she said, I can't believe how bad that was. I, I said, you were under very, very difficult aspects. Then. And then it goes away and you never have to do it again. But sometimes we have droughts and sometimes we have mudslides and we, we get them in, in our own being. We get these weather things that are sometimes really hard. As you know, you just went through a bunch of them. Right. Leslie, I, I want to be mindful of your time, but I want to first thank you for taking the time to be with me. It's always so great to see you. And I know, I could talk to you literally. I could talk for three hours nonstop. I know, we could, (laughs) totally. Um, I want to ask you to let people know where they can reach you for a reading, to learn more about you, to order your book. What's the best way to get get that info? Okay, so my book, The Power of Mercury, you can buy at your local bookstore if there is such a thing left on this planet <laughs> or go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble, wherever it's called the power of mercury. And if you would like to have a reading, you can go to my website. It's just my name, Leslie And it's L E S L I E M C G U I R K.com. My assistant, her name is Lindsay. You can email her at Lindsay at Leslie If you don't want to book it online, but she can handle it um, as well. And so I can do private readings. I can do 30 minute readings. I can do an hour reading. Um, They, they are not inexpensive, but I promise people that what you get in the time that I spend with you can save you so much money. I, I, I can tell you many, many stories of people who have agreed with me that if I can do in 30 minutes or in an hour, what you can't get anywhere else and it's it's a it's a it's a huge investment in your peace of mind and future because whatever I do it lasts for your whole life too you don't really need to have another reading with me if you even get one but um and then the other most important thing where I'm really focusing my 
future attention is on teaching people how to read charts because there's only one of me and I want people to learn how to use astrology as if you're learning how to play the guitar. You cannot learn the guitar by reading a book. Most people teach astrology using the head and memorizing and all. It's, it's very difficult to learn in a normal, quote unquote, normal way. So what I do is I figured out how to get people to play with me. We're gonna play with astrology, just like you play the guitar. That's how you learn a musical instrument. You have to play it. So we have to play with the zodiac signs and with the planets. And I turn them into, I turn it into a game. And I pretend all the planets are people and you know the wheel is like a floor plan for a house. And I get it away from all the techno, technological uh, lingo that can be involved with astrology because it's too much. You'll, right. you'll get so confused and then you won't be able to digest any of it. Right. Uh, it's so important, and I love your um, your metaphors and symbols for things. Um, it does make it a lot easier. Um, and even as Tracy, even when I do a reading, I barely use astrological language. I just basically tell a story. I just use metaphor for the entire time. I just this is, and and I have people look at their chart with me, and I have them see the way they're designed. So we're like literally reading a piece of music together. And I, the reason why I want people to look at the chart, I want them to see why I'm saying what I'm saying so that they understand, okay, so these are the drums and these are the cymbals. These are the flutes. The drums are too much. They're beating you up. We got to tone them down. You know, and then when people see it, they realize, wow, I do have an owner's manual. This makes total sense. <laughs> I love it. Astrology as an owner's manual. I've never heard it said that way, but it is so helpful to think of it that way. So you feel better now knowing I that, do. I that do. Capricorn is, um, Pluto's leaving Capricorn <laughs> and that tension that you've had for so long, it's just finally, it's on the, on the way out. Yay. I can't wait. I am going to try and read my owner's manual. Um, I mean, I'm not kidding. Um, Leslie, thank you so much for You're being welcome. here today. Always so great to see you. Say hi to your lovely babies. And um, I am looking forward to catching up again soon. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you liked the episode you just heard, please remember to like, share, and follow. And until next time, I wish you all the very best as always.